Welcome to the Talent Optimization Podcast, the go-to podcast for CEOs and HR professionals wanting to bridge the gap between the strategy and tactical implementation of talent optimization within their organizations. Through interviews, predictive index, and personal experience, your host, Tracy Shirk, helps you discover the facets of talent optimization from both a CEO and HR perspective to truly create the dream team for your organization. Are you ready? Let's get started. Welcome to the Talent Optimization Podcast. We are chatting this month about HR self-care, what that specifically looks like. And you know, I have been chatting with our guest today, Matt Pepsell, for several years now on really how do we serve inside of our organization? What does that specifically look like from ensuring that our people are in the right place, in the right role, that our leaders are leading in the right way, that our teams are turning up our strengths, and that the organizational culture is truly aligned with individual's values. And Matt has just written a brand new book called Expand the Circle, um, and it is absolutely phenomenal. And so we're going to dig into that a little bit today. So Matt, welcome. Tracy, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about our conversation. Absolutely. And P.S., if you have not heard of Matt before, he was in episode two that kicked off this podcast that we didn't know, or I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And he was so gracious to be like, yeah, I'll help you out. So (laughs) <laughs> and taking me way back. I loved it. I know. I know, right? Like to episode two, and this will be, I don't know, one one something. So Matt, tell me a little bit about why you chose to go down this path and write this book called Expand the Circle. Yeah, I've been a leader in organizations for more than 25 years now. It's pretty, pretty incredible. And I've just always appreciated and, and respected the role that leadership plays in making our organizations work better. I had my first adult working experience in the U.S. Marine Corps, and they jammed a book of leadership principles in my hand. And I thought, wow, adults are really all over this. And as soon as I got out of the service and I went to the corporate world, I was like, let's do more of that leadership stuff. And they're like, what are you talking about? I don't, that's not something we do here. I was like, oh no. So I ended up with a trunk full of books on tape back in the day and self-studying leadership. And I fell in love with it so much that I went and enrolled in a PhD program for coaching and leadership. And I've always been kind of studying the craft as well as doing the craft. And it was all working really well right up until the pandemic. And all of a sudden, we all were thrust into this new world of work. And I didn't feel myself at all, Tracy. I was like, what is happening? I don't feel like I'm showing up as the leader I want to be. And I had my values reprioritized. And I had to fight through it. And for me, it meant self-care in the form of trying to figure out how to get myself back to stable footing. And that meant a meditation cushion. So as I was sitting in meditation and and thinking about uh, what really matters and trying to find the real depths of these things, I hit on a Tibetan Buddhist meditation technique called expanding the circle of compassion. And you basically wish well for yourself and then maybe your spouse and your family. Can you push it out even further to go to coworkers? And what about a stranger? Can you push even further to all sentient beings in the universe? And I thought that was so beautiful. But what hit me was, this is how leadership works. You have to learn to lead yourself before you can lead others, before you can lead a team, before you can lead an entire organization, and finally out into the world. So that became the the spirit of of the book, and it's it's very authentic and raw for for me. But it's something that I'm just really happy to be sharing with other leaders. Awesome! Thank you so much for that. And I love how you touched on that self care that you needed to do to really ground yourself. You know, and our theme this month on our podcast is HR self care. And with that self-care for HR leaders, one of the things that we find has, we have so many conversations about is what is your why? Like, why are you doing the work that you're doing? And is that work aligned with the organizational values, right? So as I was reading through your book, there was, you know, a quote that really kind of came up for me. And it was really talking about um, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. And you want to dig into that a little bit for us and really what what that meant to you, what that meant to leadership, and what that means inside of an organization, especially as you're leading yourself first. And that was like six questions. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's, that's how I love to receive the questions too. I think that um, one of the things that you hit on that's really important when we talk about self-care 
from what I've seen and and just in conversations and certainly the statistics, it's it's heartbreaking what's happening in HR right now. The level of burnout and stress, the the challenges. So my hat goes off completely to our people leaders inside organizations because we've thrown at HR and people ops and talent, whatever the term is that that any organization prefers, questions and problems that the world has never seen before. And we've said, let's get some answers here. And our HR professionals will be like, okay, hold on a second. Like we, we are going through this too. So I, I think self-care is really important. And what you hit on in your question was really what showed up for me in that lead yourself chapter. In lead yourself in the framework, I start with uh, self-awareness as a foundation. And I move through uh, talking about things like self-acceptance. And that's something that many leaders don't make their way to. I move in through self-confidence and through authenticity. But in leadership, what happens is something that we have to be able to leave our own self-concern and transcend that and really concern ourselves with something bigger than ourselves. And that's where the quote that you had had, uh, commented on showed up. In uh, the concentration camps is where Viktor Frankl found himself after being trained as a psychologist. And he did everything he could to try to help those around him. He wrote a book about his experiences called Man's Search for Meaning. And he hit on that quote that you shared, which is that when you have that why, you can survive almost any, any, uh, anyhow. And, and I think that this is really, um, that's the most, one of the most obviously extreme situations we can face, but the principle isn't lost, which is that when you have that why, it insulates you from a lot of the friction that organizations um, often find themselves producing. And I think for HR, the nobility of helping our people be safe and well and to perform well, and to have career paths. I can't think of anything more noble we do in our businesses, but boy, it gets discounted in pursuit of profits in too many organizations. HR doesn't always get the seat at the table that they should have. And I think that's where that why really becomes important. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for that. And I think the other part of this that that, that I want to kind of hit home a little bit as well for HR leaders and our small business owners that are listening in, because that's a huge group of our audience, is there are times where decisions need to be made inside of organizations where the how may not be great, or you're changing a culture, and that how is rocky, it's bumpy, there's layoffs that are happening. So why are we doing it? And how do we ensure, one, that we're grounded in that why, but that why is also aligned with that mission, vision, values of the organization and really clear in any of those hard conversations that are very specifically happening. Completely. And I think that if we've done the work of getting close to our people and establishing trust, creating environments of safety, sharing and and making sure we have alignment with the mission, we've developed a robust culture, all of these things will insulate a lot of these changes, sometimes that come from the macro economy, sometimes those tough decisions like you're talking about, Tracy, that, that inevitably happen in business. Your team will navigate with you those challenges. If we haven't done the work because we've given short shrift or leadership, then they're not going to be as willing to give us their trust and their energy and their commitment when things inevitably get hard. So we have to, we have to do the hard work first. And we have to make sure that we constantly come back to that why. Stakeholders, uh, the, the mission that we have, these things will help us get through tough times. Yeah, absolutely. And you had some Bs that you wanted to talk about as we shift here a little bit. Yeah, I think I didn't uh, describe it in the beginning, but one thing when I committed to writing the book and, and even doing the self-examination of why am I feeling what I'm feeling, I t- decided to take a step back. And as a PhD researcher, of course, I was wanting to look at the landscape. And what I came to discover is that over the last even five years, work is unrecognizable. It has changed completely, especially in knowledge work. But in almost every industry, we've seen dramatic changes because of collaboration and technology, remote work. Gen Z is now pouring into the workforce. Tons and tons of changes. The workers themselves have changed too, though. And what we expect from work and the role we want work to play in our lives, I believe is forever changed because of the pandemic because of of these types of situations, because of generational values. And so what you're referring to is this this notion that I found, which is that we have moved beyond our needs for just a paycheck. We've moved beyond just the basic benefits package or even a really attractive benefits package. These things are still important, 
But now we've graduated as workers to wanting this next level of our needs to be satisfied. And that's the needs for being, belonging, and something bigger than myself. Can I show up and even discover who I am authentically through my workplace? Can I develop strong social ties with my coworkers and those around me? And are we serving a mission that I feel good about? Am I going beyond my own self-interest to try to, to be a part of something? These are needs now that workers are showing up with, and not every organization is able to tick all those boxes and say, absolutely. So that's where leadership shows up as a bridge between the work that we're asking people to do and satisfying those three Bs. And I think something that that you just said that happens so often is there's also a bridge between how HR talks and how our leaders, you know, those in the C-suite talk and our CEOs Because so often what I find in our consulting is that HR is saying one thing and the leadership team is saying another. They're actually saying the same thing, but they're talking right past each other because it has not been translated to each other. And that skill set isn't there. So really, one of the things that I took away is how do we take a step back really and step into, okay, let me understand what they're saying and how can I translate it into the seat that I'm sitting in right now, and to take it one step further, how can I get my needs met to translate that into getting what I need from another as well? Yeah, 100%. And I feel like, you know, your audience knows talent optimization really well. Talent optimization is uniquely suited to be that bridge between the people and the business, because they're really two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. Nobody gets to pass from business strategy all the way to business results without going through the people part. And so it's kind of, uh, if we're talking past one another, we just need to slow down and start using talent optimization techniques and terms to be able to connect those dots. Where the work that I've written about recently picks up is even more sort of human and intrinsic in us and trying to show that we're actually more connected than it might seem. There's this, this distinct reality that you could almost think of an organization as being completely tied together. If one department or one individual is having a bad time of things, it's this closed system. Like we right. need to be aware of that. We need to take action on that. We can't allow that to happen because of the nature of the, the connectivity and the unity that takes place. How many times have you seen, you know, somebody who's having a tough time, that negativity sort of spill out across the rest of the team members. And pretty soon you've got a team that's actually causing a problem with the next team next to them. And like we're, I think that there's definitely a need to have that common language and that bridge, but also revert to our basic humanity and say, how can we help? How can we help change the situation? Absolutely. And so for my HR listeners that are thinking in terms of policy here, I want to give you a really specific example, okay? Um, So I love taking these and saying, you know, so often our HR policies and our compensation policies, specifically around performance management, are independent, right? Right. It's not the interconnectedness, Matt, that I just heard you talk about that is so incredibly important. And so if we think about our HR policies specifically around performance management, are we doing performance management on an individual performance? Are we doing performance management on the team and how that team is elevating? The same with compensation. Are we providing compensation 100% based on an individual, especially if we have bonuses? And what they are doing, meaning they're competing with a person next to them, or are we doing compensation that's team-based that means that there's an interdependence to it? So I just want to create that bridge because I know so many of my HR leaders that are listening in are very much um, tactical and detail-oriented, but to to bridge that into what some of the leadership conversations are happening. Yeah, and I think this is where we really have to have mutual respect in the sense that historically a performance measure was strictly about economics. Like, are you doing the, putting up the KPIs and all these kinds of things and the metrics that we want to see? That's not enough. Today, what we need to be evaluating leaders is yes, are you driving the business? But are you also driving high levels of team engagement? I don't want to promote somebody or reward somebody financially if they're able to achieve the business results but their team is having a disastrous time and is leaving them in droves. But there's actually now even a third component. What Gen Z is telling us as they flood into the workplace is we want coaching and development. We want guidance. We want to grow. So now we have to add, it's not just enough to perform and make sure your team performs. 
to make sure that they're having a great experience at work. We also need to be able to invest. How are you how are you growing the leaders of the future of this organization? And that's a more holistic definition of success that's uh, really appropriate, in my opinion, for promotion and for compensation. Because if we just in, in, invest in people who are driving performance, but not the other two critical legs of the stool, we if you fast forward, you know what kind of organization you're going to get. It's going to be weak and brittle. Mm -hmm. we've, we've got to do better. And that's where that mutual respect of the leadership can talk about the future of the business and we're going to change and transform and all these things. Those will not happen if we continue to reward leaders in the old way. We've got to take this more evolved or what I would say a more enlightened view of the opportunity that leaders have. Absolutely. You know, and I love the, the, that notion you just said. We've been doing a ton of mentorship programs where we're taking um, line level staff and essentially saying, let's train you on some of those leadership skills. You're going to take a new hire under the arm and you're that person that's going to lead them you know, for their first 90 days, it what that does is it improves the retention of our new hires in the first 90 days, but it's creating the pathway into higher level positions. But it's also really showing, look, we care about how you're interacting. We care about those leadership skills, and we're going to teach those to you right away. And the other thing, you know, specifically relating to this is coaching. You know, so many of the HR professionals that we work with have never been coached, but yet they're asked to coach inside their organization. And it's like, well, how do you do that? You know, and what I love so much about what you've talked about in your book is you've got the, the empathy and the compassion, you know, and that, that alignment to work. Well, coaching is so much about creating the space without judgment for, for the individual to really step into their own mindfulness by having the space to do it without someone else judging them. Definitely. And then, and as you pointed out, when we move beyond ourselves and now we're ready to lead others, and this fits hand in glove with coaching as well, we start with empathy to your point. Can we actually take an active appreciation of the experience of others and recognize they may be having a very different experience than me? So let's say that I'm a Gen X mentor of a Gen Z person. I want to understand their experience. I don't want to pretend that they have the same mindset entering the workforce that I did. They don't. Well, what about the second part, which is all about altruism? Am I willing to invest in somebody who's not my direct report when there may not be an immediate return for me? The answer is yes, because that's the right thing to do. And that's the the way that we're going to make the firm stronger. And this is going to make a human connection. You move into things like trust. How do you establish trust in that mentorship relationship? What about fairness and equanimity and making sure that we really do uh, make sure I, I cover, for example, differences in personality, something you know a tremendous amount about. I host a Zoom call and let all my extroverts dominate the introverts. That's not being a good team leader at all. And now we're seeing neurodiversity, the things that we haven't talked about before. Those need to be brought into the fore. And then finally, when we talk about the level of connectedness and the fact that I can be a Gen X mentor to a Gen Z person, if I establish that bond and realize we're really not all that different, that we really are connected on this deeply human level within the context of work. And then, then the natural coaching and the beautiful uh, sort of outcomes will absolutely happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for our listeners listening in, you've heard a little bit about, you know, a couple of excerpts from the book, some of those key points. But one of the things I love, Matt, is at the end of the book, you kind of looked at it from a couple of different lenses. And so, you know, we always ask two questions to our guests on the show is what's one key takeaway that you have for executives listening in? And I love for you to couch that in kind of that, that, that closing piece in your book. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the message for executives that I have is that the world is changing at these rapid rates. And every executive I talk to talks about transformation. We've got to transform this, digital transformation, sales, supply chain, everything's transforming. And we want to be able to, to develop the ability to pivot more quickly. So now we're asking our teams to be able to, uh, to move and to change, but also to do it very efficiently. And what I believe is that the executives have to make the priority investment in leadership development, that leadership capacity, and in my view, enlightened leadership capacity, is what's going to allow you to be successful moving forward in a very human but fast-paced changing world. So that to me comes down to driving up the levels of mindfulness and compassion and wisdom within our leaders and helping them to turn down the volume on self-interest 
in a way that just hasn't been the case for us in the past. We used to say the leader is this lone wolf and this put him up on a pedestal. That is not the future of leadership. So I would say to the executives, if you really want what you're describing as the future of work, you have to embrace the future of leadership and you have to invest in it. Great. Thank you. And how about for HR leaders? For HR leaders, I think one part is the same as it's always been, which is making a strong business case and being able to take that strategic partnership and really show how all the things that you're naturally trained to do show up in the business. So I rely very heavily on talent optimization principles in my work with HR leaders to make sure that we are connecting the dots to actual things like strategy risk for things that haven't happened yet and for missed targets. Any missed target, as an example, is an evidence that we've missed some aspect of talent optimization. So helping HR to really drill down on that and make the case because you're professionals for a reason, you're trained in these things in a way that the line of business isn't, but they're really, we've conditioned in them in all of our business schools to care so much about the bottom line. We have to speak to them in their language. But the second part of it, I think, is to embrace that personal power of a very human centric future and really don't shy away from the fact that you are the experts in the domain that's going to be the only competitive differentiator left. With all of the AI and the technology and everything that's changing, it's the, the performance and the welfare of people is the battleground. And so I feel like HR deserves that seat at the table. I want to see and encourage HR leaders to use their dual capability to be business relevant, but also people expert to really embrace and claim that power. Great. Thank you so much for that. And I love that business relevant and people expert. So Great. So in the show notes, we will link to your website, Matt, along with um, Predictive Index, of course, your previous podcast, um, and of course, the book. We're we're not going to leave that one out. I appreciate it so much. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for those of you listening, and thank you so much for joining us today as we chatted about, you know, how do we expand that circle? What does that specifically look like? And if you are interested in that HR coaching, we will also have that link there for you as well. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Talent Optimization Podcast. You'll find more tools and resources for CEOs and HR professionals looking to bridge the strategies versus implementation gap of talent optimization at elevatedtalentconsulting.com. We've also created a free, valuable resource for you to begin bridging the gap called the Talent Optimization Foundation Membership Program. You can access it for free at elevatedtalentconsulting.com forward slash foundation. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode to learn more about talent optimization and creating a dream team for your organization.